Welcome to the 41st Lifetime Achievement Awards and the Women's Caucus for Arts 50th Anniversary Celebration. Occupy the moment, embracing our history, enhancing our impact. 50 years ago in a meeting organized by Ann Sutherland Harris, 300 women met in an overflowing conference room at CAA, College Art Association, to tell their stories of gender discrimination in art. A hat was passed, contact information and money were collected and the Women's Caucus of the College Art Association was born. In 1974, the organization became independent of CAA and was renamed the Women's Caucus for Art, WCA, in order to create their own vision and goals for the future. In 1979, the first WCA Lifetime Achievement Awards were awarded in President Carter's Oval Office to Isabel Bishop, Selma Burke, Alice Neal, Louise Nevelson, and Georgia O'Keeffe. The awards were one of the first awards at recognizing the contribution of women to the arts and their profound effect in the world. The awards honored their work, their vision, their commitment, and their sheer determination to create their work. Women have made amazing advancements since 1972. However, 2022 finds us at a unique moment in time. The COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically altered our world. Deep-seated gender and racial inequality has been unmasked and our rights are actively under political attack. It's clear that the fight for equity for women is far from over. The Lifetime Achievement Awards and the need for women to be in the arts to be recognized, to be validated, to be heard, and to be acknowledged is more important than ever. We do this so that our future generations will see the depth and breadth of the important work that these women have contributed to the arts and to our society. The awards are a powerful history, not only for the Women's Caucus for Art, but for everyone to share. These women's lives and accomplishments will be forever woven into the fabric of the history of our country and our culture. And so it is my distinct pleasure and great honor to present the 2022 Lifetime Achievement Awards to Linda Banglis, Beata Minkowski, Gladys Nielsen, Lorraine O'Grady, and Linda Vallejo. Sabrina Nelson is the President's Awardee for Art and Activism, and the recipient of WCA's new Emerging Artist Award is Ashley January. These amazing women have, in many different ways, embodied WCA's mission to create community through art, education, and social activism throughout the course of their careers. They are occupying this moment, and their contributions will continue to make a positive impact for us all far into the future. Well, we're back. Hi, everyone. That was such a wonderful, you know, history and opening to tonight. And it's just the beginning. Um, uh, welcome to the 41st WCA Lifetime Achievement Award video premiere. I am Donna Jackson, your host, well, one of your hosts, and the current WCA president. And I want to introduce our other two hosts. Um, Laura Morrison, who is the past president and the lovely face you just saw in the beginning of the video. And Sandra Davis, our president elect. So this has been a long time coming, been working on this for a little bit over a year. And now we are here, um, as um, Laura said in the video, um, COVID has changed how we do things. And this is why we're on this platform. And isn't that right, Sandra, um, talking about this great opportunity we have here? Absolutely. So I remember attending the conference in 2020, right before we shut down for COVID. And we had already agreed not to have a conference in 2021 because we really wanted to have an opportunity to really plan out our 50th anniversary. So who knew by March 19th, 
we would all be in shutdown mode. And so we really wanted to have an opportunity for everybody who has the chance to view YouTube or Facebook or what have you to be able to experience the Lifetime Achievement Awards without having to leave the comfort of their home. And um, taking advantage of the technology that has now afforded us all to figure out a way to connect with each other across the country, across the globe. So I'm really, really happy um, to be part of this uh, Achievement Awardees. And um, I wanna turn it over to Laura so she can explain a little bit more about what we're gonna see tonight. Laura. All right, well, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Donna. Um, you know, I had a great time traveling on, around the country to honor these incredible women. Um, it really was a once in a lifetime experience for me. Um, meeting with them and talking with them in their studios was so much fun and really um, just a, a wonderful inspiration to me on um, meeting everybody and seeing their work. Um, the presentation you'll see tonight is really kind of modeled after our normal in-person um, Lifetime Achievement Awards ceremony. Um, I want to thank Janice Nesser Chu for all of the really hard work she did into uh, uh, coordinating this production and um, coordinating the Lifetime Achievement Awards and also to the Lifetime Achievement Award Committee for their dedicated work um, selecting all of the awardees. Um, each awardee will have a presenter that will talk about their life's work, um, which will be followed by an award presentation um, by myself given to them in their studios. Um, so that is kind of how the format of the of the production will go. Um, if you've never been to a Lifetime Achievement Awards ceremony, um, now you'll be able to enjoy this sh the show from the uh, comfort of your home, and you'll have a, a good flavor of how the Lifetime Achievement Awards ceremonies uh, work. So we will check in again um, before we will honor the, life, the uh, President's awardees towards the end of the show, um, but during the show, you can make comments and offer your congratulations in whatever form you are viewing from, be it Facebook, Instagram, your laptop, whatever. So without further ado, let's all raise a glass and offer and toast our awardees and offer them our congratulations. Uh, everyone, now enjoy the show. Enjoy. Enjoy. The first honoree we are celebrating today is Linda Banglis. I traveled to New Mexico to visit Linda and honor her with her award. Currently, Linda has several exhibitions happening in the United States in Sao Paulo. She recently closed an exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington, DC, and she is preparing for another exhibition in London in 2023. It was wonderful to meet Linda, see her creative process, and see her works in progress. I'd like to introduce David J. Getze, Professor of Art History at the University of Virginia. David has written an essay and will be giving a presentation about Linda and her work. Thank you, Laura. Linda Benglis has been a defining force in art, sculpture, and video since the late 1960s. Flouting both medium and convention, her work has transgressed boundaries while nevertheless speaking to central and long-running issues about art's histories, materials, and contexts. Her work teaches us what sculpture is and can be, and she has always balanced her appropriation of sculpture's monumental scale with unlikely material liquidities, tactical superficialities, and graceful motilities. From her earliest work in the mid-1960s to the present day, Benglis has rejected imposed categories. Her work moves in between sculpture and painting and performance and video, and she was on the forefront of developing a new set of expanded sculptural vocabularies. As well, she drew from art theoretical positions that many saw as mutually exclusive, and she willfully and capriciously adapted aspects of abstract expressionism and minimalism. Some of her earliest works, such as the 1966-67 to 67 Untitled, manifest this fusion by making works that could be read as gestural and as reductively geometric at the same time. Developing materials that slowed the viscosity and the fluidity of paint and pigment, Begliss began to make artworks that could be read as the result of determined gestures, 
as resolutely and defiantly material and as literalist and direct. In these works, she brushed colored wax repeatedly along a line until it burst and crackled with depths both hidden and revealed. Throughout, she exceeded the limitations of convention and medium, sometimes in confrontational ways, as with her pigmented latex spills that operate as floor-bound paintings and as sight-enveloping sculptures. Consistently in her work, Benglis has collapsed the oppositions and separations that others assume cannot be changed. A central theme of her work across its wide range of practices and media has been her refusal to accept binary structures. Binaries comprise two opposed concepts locked together in a hierarchical, but nevertheless mutual interdependence with both dominant and submit subordinate halves defined in opposition to their needed and needful counterpart. Binaries accept no outside, no third term in their flatland worldview. And it has been such delimited cartographies that Benglis has relentlessly mocked and subverted with some of her main targets being figure ground, proper improper, high low, and male female. We see this in Benglis's floor and wall bound sculptures that refuse to obey the coordinates of figure ground. Using viscous industrial materials that hardened into arrested flows, Benglis overtook the floor with poured colors each swirling into the next, thus displacing figure ground dynamics with thick adjacencies of colored bands and rivulets that hug the floor and each other. These works do more than short circuit the end games of modernist painting and sculpture. They're also excessive in their color. For a Benglis, questions of taste have been one more imposed structure to be flouted or simply ignored. In other works of these early years, she stacked poured materials in a wry move that made the minimalist doctrine of one thing after another look finicky and sterile. As part of these investigations, Benglis preferred new and adventurous materials that made their changing states visible. However solid and monumental the floor-bound spills or piles of mud-like pores are now, they nevertheless still retain the look and the evidence of their liquid states. That is, Benglis cultivated hybridity in her materials and processes, with the resulting objects being caught in a moment of arrested transition in their response to gravity. This was famously called the frozen gesture in Benglis's work, but it's more than that. These works ask to be seen as changed, changeable, and changing. Ambitiously, these poured polyurethane sculptures become their own structures. They can be read simultaneously as evidence of gravitational pull and as a structure that defies it. For some works, like the remarkable Phantom, the phase changes uh, become even more accentuated through the use of phosphorescence that animates them as figures and as entities. Throughout, in-betweenness, changeability, and the visualization of multi-form potentiality remain her aims. Such priorities, we should remember, were anathema to sculpture, a medium that, for centuries prior, was determined by its solidity, its monumental aspirations to permanence, and its immotility. By contrast, Benglis paradoxically made sculptures as painterly records of actions in three dimensions, but she did so without losing their capacity to hold and to overtake space. Benglis's investigation into the oxymoron of sculptural gesture later took the form of knotted wall sculptures. She twisted thick tubes into knots, liberating the line from the space of the canvas and its controlling ground. These knotted tubes too became surfaces themselves for color and shine, and Benglis employed palettes that were deemed excessive, feminine, or gaudy. These colors adorned flat surfaces and were turned into these tubes, torsos, and other biomorphic forms. Like in her earlier work, these were evidently created through the manipulation of materials, and they continued with the collapsing of opposites that has been characteristic of her practice. 
These works are both flat planes and sculptural figures, and the simple and direct gestures that turn the flat into the sculptural are evident in these works. And then there are the remarkable folded and crenellated swirls of Benglis' sculpture of the 1980s. These two oppose the opposition between flatness and depth, plane and structure. Evoking the flow of drapery, these works are clusters of vectors pushing outward to suggest bodies and actions. Benglis' sculptures are resolutely abstract and they avoid the representation of the specific figure. However, these crenellated sheets take on volume to become unprecedented bodily contours that compress and expand into each other. They contain and convey the physicality, the actions and the struggles that were required to realize the final form of each work. For instance, the tension of the central knot in a work like Triple Two is both determined and graceful. The lightness of this form is the result of a Herculean effort to create the central bind that holds it together. The collapsing of oppositions in Benglis's work between flatness and solidity, gesture and monumentality, surface and depth, and malleability and solidity are the result of Benglis's concerted questioning of received categories and their limitations. These operations were not merely formal, material, or processual for Benglis. Rather, they have been attempts to work out through hybrids of painting, sculpture, and ceramics, how to visualize freedom from the confinements of orthodox definitions and conventions. Benglis makes gestures, colors, and forms both concrete and independent, demanding that we see them for what they are now. Throughout her career, Benglis has questioned decorum and the ideas of common sense or propriety. She has refused to accept that certain forms, colors, or materials are kitschy, low, vulgar, or tacky. Instead, she makes them grand and monumental. She has flouted received values, be they formal or social, through her preferred strategy of mockery. To mock is to reflect back something with absurdity and excessiveness. And that is one way that we can understand Benglis's strategically steely pastel palette or the lampooning of the limited roles into which artists are cast. A main nemesis for Benglis's mockery has been one of the most draconian of binary structures, that of a hierarchical mapping of the world as either female or male. Drawing from the energy of the feminist movement since the 1970s, Benglis has rejected not just the hierarchies that placed men over women, she has also jettisoned the axiom that the world could be so neatly and reductively divided in the first place. Benglis has often spoke of her acts of mockery directed at her frustration with such binary structures as male and female. In their place, she has pursued mashups of gender's signification, the collapsing of binaries, perverse palettes, and most of all, an epicene potential in forms. Her knots and tubes exceed simple designations of the body or gender, and she has formed torsos out of limbs that rebuff being seen through the either or of gender assignment. This is perhaps more directly figured in Benglis's work of the early 1970s in video. And here I move back to this earlier part of her career to remind that Benglis was one of the most astute and adventurous artists working in video at that time. Her works are fundamental to an understanding of video art, its relation to popular culture, and its capacities for feedback and disruption. In works such as Female Sensibility and Now, Benglis positioned herself between actor and image, sometimes literally performing with her own past actions recorded on video. As with her sculptures that refused binarism and sought moments of transitoriness or lability, Benglis's videos also sought a position between opposites. A recurring image in Benglis's video, one that I take to be both allegorical and organizing, is the tongue. The tongue is a bodily organ that commands eroticism beyond the division into male and female. 
prehensile and tensile. The tongue in Benglis's work is an analog to the knotted forms of her epicene sculptures that create their particularity anew with each twist and fold. One shouldn't forget that in Benglis's revolutionary video about an intersex talking dog, The Amazing Bow Wow, which was uh, created with Stanton K in 1976, in that video, it is the tongue rather than the genitals that provides the denouement of that plot. The roll sheets that become tubes, that become knots, that become surfaces of her sculptures of this time are related to the imagery that she was exploring in video. In both, the aim was to think about how bodies could be evoked without being imaged and how the body could be imagined in open-ended ways that spoke to its capacities rather than the limited ways that others saw them. I see Benglis's works and all their varieties as attempting to visualize such capacity for change, malleability, and changes of state. Even in the durable form of the public sculpture or fountain, Benglis's works remind us of the other phases these materials have gone through. Throughout, Benglis asks asks us to see the solid as liquid and vice versa. Refusing opposition, Benglis keeps an active tension in her works that are composed of flat surfaces and spills that nevertheless command space. Or in her newest work that makes monumental handheld forms of extruded clay, we can see sophisticated and conceptually rich play with the constraints normally assumed of the sculptural and the pictorial. In Yellowtail, for instance, Benglis has strategically and perversely established a dynamic relationship between an endlessly malleable sculptural material, clay, that has been transformed into a flat plane only to be twisted into a sculptural mobius that takes up space as well as offering an image of infinite surface. Cast in polished bronze, a traditional sculptural material, Yellowtail's reflectivity and shine further deflect our attention from solidity to that looping surface, as with the Mobius strip, that we can see the both sides of at once, despite its, its continuity as a single plane. Yellowtail speaks to and engages with some of the longest running debates about sculpture's relationship with and differentiation from painting, that is of the solid versus the flat, while nevertheless refusing to accept that these things can be opposed or even distinguished. Now, I imagine that there might be some listening who are surprised that I have focused on such formalist concerns as flatness and depth or plain and solid. There are certainly other ways to navigate through the many pathways of Benglis's work. But what I find so compelling about that work is the ways that such simple and repeatable questions like these can become allegorical and themselves monumental. Benglis's works implode categories on purpose and ask us how we can see a given form for what it was and simultaneously how it can be transformed. Throughout, her work has positioned itself at a poised place in between opposed or successive states and it is from that position that it demands an openness to seeing things for their uniqueness and their capacity to be. However formal these tools are, the message of these works is nevertheless about how we might view each other in this same way. That is, as a result of the forces that made us, but as more than what we were told we could be. Humanism is the word that Benglis has often used to summarize her priorities. By this, she means something precise, that of treating people as potential and particularity rather than viewing them through a pre-existing set of assumptions or categories. Just as when she freed the gestural mark from the canvas or the wall, she demands that we see a form for what it can become. Thank you, David, for sharing the depth and breadth of Linda's monumental works. We honor you, Linda Banglis, for expanding the boundaries of media and gender with your endless exploration of techniques and materials. Congratulations. Thank you very much. What a lovely moment it is for me to accept this beautiful award.
Well, we're very excited to have you as one of our awardees on our 50th year. Thank you. It's a very special occasion. Well, thank and you. It's wonderful to be able to come out here and meet you and see your studio and visit New Mexico. I can say that wherever I am, I feel at home as long as I can make art. And uh, I think art is the process of being and of understanding mm -hmm. uh, how you interpret your space and how you interpret uh, life and uh, the expression of feeling. We're both so honored, Cleo and I. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Cleo and I are very well, we're honored. We're very honored. Well, thank you. To meet you and award you this award. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm at Women Made Gallery in Chicago to meet co-founder and former executive director, Beata Minkowski. It is so fitting for the Women's Caucus for Art to honor Beata here at Women Made Gallery, where the primary focus has been to offer exhibition opportunities to women artists. Since 1992, they have met their mission by showing work from thousands of women across the world in over 450 exhibitions. What a truly wonderful accomplishment. And now, artist and sculptor Mary Stoppert will talk about Beata's vision, mission, and her dedication to women in the arts. I am grateful to the Women's Caucus for Art for recognition of the important contributions Beata Minkowski has made to Women Made Gallery and to women's history. I am honored to present her story and accomplishments. Beata wanted this presentation to be about Woman Made Gallery, which is typical of her putting the organization first. However, this presentation is for and about this amazing woman, co-founder and guiding light of Woman Made Gallery. A successful 30-year history as a not-for-profit arts organization is an impressive accomplishment. Longevity requires diehard commitment, an unending supply of volunteers, and continuous fundraising. Woman Made still exists mainly for three reasons. Its feminist mission, its continuous inclusive outreach, and the leadership of Beata Minkowski. Even after semi-retiring from Woman Made in 2014, Beata served on the board of directors and helped facilitate the search for and hiring and training of new directors. She is currently an advisor and committee member. Woman Made has been sustained largely by grassroots contributors and the active leadership as co-founder for 22 of its 30 years. Woman Made is a testament to a personal commitment for giving women access to an often inaccessible environment for artists. It was the winter of 1945. Six months old Beata Charlotte von Hoenigen Hine was hastily nestled in a wagon surrounded by her family's possession. As they fled the place of her birthplace in Nazi occupied Polish territory, with the Red Army front approaching, they were forced to flee westward to what was then Nazi Germany. Beata's challenging childhood, which included her parents' incarceration in an English prisoner of war camp, left a lasting impression. Her parents' determination to survive yet nurture the family helped form the strong character needed to achieve her successes, both personal and professional. Beata Minkowski has been the beating heart and soul of Woman Made Gallery since its inception. A strong sense of family and duty are attributes that originate from her family's struggles to survive and flourish 
in an occupied World War II Germany. Being the eldest of five children, she was an expected and natural caretaker. Her role as a nurturer has never really diminished as Yada married and at 22 years old, emigrated to the US where she would raise five children of her own. Her approach to co-founding, developing and sustaining Woman Made was not unlike she has been with her own family. Beata introduces herself on her Facebook page in this exact order. Mother, grandmother, feminist, artist, and co-founder of Woman Made Gallery. Yes, mother and then grandmother. So in spite of her many years as a leader of Woman Made, she values those maternal roles. Her mother, Gisela, was and is a guiding force who was self-taught, but it was accomplished in many realms. She was talented and shared the love of art with Beata. Her special relationship with her mother also explains Beata's management style. Woman made is the child she has guided from birth to maturity and of which she has now become the symbolic grandmother. There has always been the presence of nurturing and caring in Beata's approaches to problem solving and her management style. Her background and studies were in art and no formal business or administrative studies. She has wisely used her survival instincts and learn to seek the collaboration of others to balance the work and address areas in which she feels less accomplished. Beata is a natural communicator and she has used these skills well to recruit excellent support and expertise as it was needed. Her friendly and caring demeanor lends confidence to the unconfident gives presence to the unrecognized. Hers is a gift that has helped so many less secure and shy women artists find their voices. All that said, she can still be very direct and at times brutally honest, all meant to teach and motivate. I have watched Beata's growth since she was my student. She returned to school at 44 years old after raising five children, and she was very focused and motivated. She quickly became the art department darling as she efficiently kept the studios functioning as a valued and trusted student aide and art scholarship student. Beata and Kelly Henson were natural buddies both sculpture students and returning adults. They joined a group of focused, like-minded, and also returning women art students who encouraged each other. In 1992, Beata and Kelly, another stellar student, decided to rent and refurbish a vacant Chicago Ravenswood Manor neighborhood store in which to display their Northeastern Illinois University senior thesis ex exhibitions. I found this consistent with the way the two had approached their four years as art students, fearless, committed, and just a bit crazy. It was a narrow storefront that shared a long north facing wall with the Ravenswood L train station and tracks. The train rumbled by with frequency mere feet away on the ground level. The sound and sensation were like the patriarchy was monitoring the sacred and rich activity within. Located in an old business district, one block long on each side of the Rockwell station, there was a ready-made audience, which included a mix of L train commuters and longtime residents. Many were immigrants shopping the neighborhood. 
The location may not seem an unusual choice for a studio, gallery, and cafe, but these two artists are about to create a space for and about women with no subject considered taboo. Their thesis exhibition art addressed the variety of stereotypes of how and the patriarchy portrayed women and thus the title man-made woman. The theme and art in this in inaugural exhibition might be considered moderate today, but the silent and mostly unseen art by women artists was about to speak through this new gallery venue. This was the very beginning of years of challenging subjects and themes that Woman Made would commit to exploring in their program. That is the marvel of Woman Made Gallery history. The organization has persevered and grown in spite of its unblinking and unapologetic feminist stance. The plan to use the space as an art studio was not possible once the cafe began serving coffee and bagels to commuters and locals curious about the art. The policy to welcome all who visited no matter their demeanor and the challengers did visit, never changed. And Beato was always a willing, enthusiastic educator. Good news traveled fast and their calls via networking and media, calls for women artists to exhibit and become members created an immediate and unexpectedly positive response. A call for art for the first exhibition Women Do Women brought such a rapid response from women needing in our community that the first Woman Made Gallery exhibition was in place within weeks of their own gallery opening. Woman Made happened organically. It became an organization driven by a need and a demand for a receptive and professional environment for women artists. In 1993, Woman Made Gallery formed its first advisory board and filed as a 501c3 not-for-profit entity. The first call for a Woman Made Gallery artist registry was created and it still exists to this day in the form of member gallery pages online. In 1993, Henson would move on to other pursuits and Janet Block joined Beata in the Woman Made Gallery Administration. The format of calls for art group themed exhibitions would continue addressing all manner of women's issues, domestic violence, women's health, gender and sexuality, and family and child endangerment. In 1994, artist Pamela Callahan joined to lend her expertise. These important and eventful years on Morocco Avenue also brought the attention of the larger feminist and activist community as the gallery hosted performances and readings by such noted act feminist activists as Angela Jackson and Sister Serpents starring Mary Ellen Croteau. The move in 1997 to the historic Prairie Avenue Keith Mansion on the near south side of Chicago, welcomed a new and broader audience, as well as the participation of established feminists. Judy Chicago became an executive advisor, and Hillary Clinton visited while dedicating the Women's Park next door. Faith Ringgold juried the International Open Exhibit, which had an astounding, for the times, 500 entries. Woman Made would move three more times, each one with the intention of an opportunity for greater community outreach, expanded mission and programming. At the time, Woman Made added the Artisan Gallery, which had its own space and exhibition program within Woman Made, offering explorations in traditional and new materials 
for craftswomen beginning on Bloomingdale in West Becktown and continuing on Milwaukee Avenue. The years on Milwaukee Avenue would establish a woman-made gallery in the art scene with the ability to host simultaneous exhibitions and events on two floors. Its central location and proximity to the Chicago Loop created an even wider and diverse following. Poetry readings that began on Prairie Avenue continued. The neighborhood outreach workshops and exhibitions with neighborhood children and adults was very popular. In 2017, Woman May moved its current location at the Lacuna Lofts on Chicago's near South Side. Social media has helped extend Woman Made's message and outreach nationally and internationally. Beata studied art for three years in Bremen, Germany, and it was always her intention to be an artist. When she came to Northeastern to resume her art career, it was apparent to all the art faculty that she was very talented. In 1992, after Woman Made Gallery came into being, her art making slowly gave way to building the organization. During her 22 years directing Woman Made Gallery, there would be limited opportunities for the focus and development of her own work. Since retirement, she has returned to her studio and is finding new expression. Beata has been spending long awaited quality time with her family, both near and far. With five children and 10 grandchildren, she has been able to spend quality one-on-one -on -one time with each. Friends she has made over the years also receive a dedicated day for studio visits, museum outings, and lunches, tea, and much love. Travel is also on her agenda with visits to family in Canada and Germany and beyond. Beata and husband Michael are enjoying this time together. He has always been there for her originally an old school man learning to make sense out of these women with a mission. Every woman made gallery location bears Mike's imprint in some manner with his skills as master electrician and fixer. Thank you both for your generous gifts. Thank you, Mary. You have beautifully honored Beata in all of her self-identified roles mother, grandmother, feminist, artist, and co-founder of Women Made Gallery. Her tenacity and dedication to lifting up women in the arts is truly inspiring. We honor you, Beata Minkowski, co-founder of Women Made Gallery, for your commitment to promote women in the arts and provide access to marginalized groups. Congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm so grateful. Thank you so very much. We feel very blessed that you are one of our awardees. Thank you. It's a great honor. You're welcome. Congratulations to the Women's Caucus for Art mm -hmm. for celebrating your 50th anniversary. Thank you. While Woman Made has its 30th mm -hmm. anniversary. What a great honor to receive the 2022 Women's Caucus for Art Lifetime Achievement Award from an organization whose mission and work I admire and that had inspired me and my work for Women Made Gallery. It amazes me to be recognized for something that feels second nature to me, that has enriched me with lifelong friendships and a community where I feel at home. Mm -hmm. I am proud to be in such fabulous company and I'm congratulating my co-recipients, noted artist Linda Bangles, Gladys Nilsson, Lorraine O'Grady, and Linda Vallejo. And congratulations also to Sabrina Nelson for receiving the President's Award for the art and activism that she's doing. And to Ashley January, who received the new Emerging Artist mm -hmm. Award. I think that's so fabulous that you're you. giving that. We're excited. I want to thank my family, my husband, Misha, our five children and 10 grandchildren for their unwavering love and support and gratitude to my friend and mentor, Mary Stoppard, who was my professor at NEIU, Northeastern Illinois University, and who freed the feminist in me. 
And thank you to my friend and rabble rouser, Kelly Hansen, with whom I began Woman Made Gallery in 1992. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, to Janet Block, who guided Woman Made on my side for 10 years. And guess what? Yeah. She taught me how to ask for money. <laughs> and then there was Pamela Callahan, who always came to the rescue just when it was needed. There are so many individuals to thank. Artists like Marianne Courteau, mm -hmm. Brenda Oelbaum, Karin Luna, who yes. I miss. Uh, I miss her art. I have four pieces. From, you know, I'm getting off track here, but <laughs> they are my sisters in arms. Mm -hmm. They really are my sisters in arms. Yes. It takes a mega village to do this work. And I'm sharing my award with all those in individuals who have impacted Woman Made Gallery and who are there now to hold up the organization. Because without that talented, wise, powerful community, generous community, I wouldn't be standing here mm -hmm. today. Nobody can do it on their own. Right. As the Woman Made Caucus for Art turns a fabulous 50, Woman Made celebrates its 30th anniversary that sounds like a mother-daughter. It does. Or mentor-mentee relationship. Yes, I would think so. It does, so. right? Yes. And I'm so glad we celebrate these important milestones together. Thank you to Janice Nessachu for her really amazing work and patience and gratitude to the Honor Awards Section Committee and to mm -hmm. the entire team who made this virtual celebration possible. Thank you to outgoing WCA president, you, Laura Morrison. Thank you. Thank you for your important work. And welcome and congratulations to the new Women's Caucus of Art president, Donna Jackson. Yes. You know what? Our work must continue. Happy 50th WCA, and thank you for the great honor. I wish my parents were still here on this earth to witness, and they are. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What thank a touching you. tribute. Thank you. <laughs>in Chicago to honor Gladys Nielsen and her home studio located just north of the city in Wilmette, Illinois. Gladys is busy creating new watercolors for her upcoming exhibition at Garth Green and Gallery this November. Her drawings and acrylic paintings from the 60s and 70s will also be shown by the gallery at the ADAA Art Show in November as well. She's pleased that her work from both the past and the present will be shown simultaneously in New York City this coming fall. Our next presenter is Mel Becker-Solomon, Associate Research Curator at the Art Institute of Chicago. We will learn more about Gladys's impressive career beginning with her start in Chicago in the 1960s with the Harry Who Group exhibitions. My name is Mel Becker-Solomon, and I'm honored to be presenting a WCA Lifetime Achievement Award to the magnificent Chicago-based artist Gladys Nelson. And yes, you heard that right. It's pronounced Nelson. I'm here to set the record straight. It's not Nilsson or Nielsen because it's Nelson, because that's how her father pronounced it. But you aren't here for a lesson in phonetics, but rather to celebrate a truly remarkable artist. For over 50 years, Nelson's artwork has employed wit, drama, and especially humor to hold a mirror up to the human condition. Nelson playfully incorporates observations from the everyday into her densely packed and magical worlds on paper. Whether she is in the waiting room at the doctor's office or boarding a plane, Nelson delights in the interactions of the people around her, filing away distinct pieces of clothing and odd bits of conversation in her visual memory bank to be used in her compositions when she returns to the studio. Throughout her work, small, often naughty, figures appear in the margins, lurking around the ankles of the larger characters in her vibrant watercolors. They giggle and question the behavior of their often blissfully unaware companions, while delighting in their own feats and follies, playing tricks and engaging in voyeurism and disguise. 
The resulting works underscore our flawed and shared humanity while highlighting the comical interactions that pervade the mundane. Often focused on the female body, which Nelson perceives as both spectacle and a source of strength, her works feature larger than life women that dominate her richly layered compositions that hold the viewer captive as their eyes take in the many wonders she's placed before them on the picture plane. Her women dance, relax under a tree, smirk, don fabulous clothing, and float. They are undeterred, open to possibility, and free from expectation. Her distinct style first became evident in watercolors, ink drawings, and paintings on plexiglass, which Nelson exhibited at the Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago in the mid-1960s. As a recent graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, her participation in the transformative Harry Who exhibition series shattered previous standards of success and visibility achievable by young Chicago artists. This was just the beginning of Nelson's triumphs, however, as she was the only artist in the Art Institute of Chicago's Chicago and Vicinity exhibition history to be awarded the first prize two years in a row in 1967 and 1968. And she was one of the first so-called Imagist artists to receive a solo exhibition at the now celebrated Phyllis Kine Gallery in 1970. Simultaneously, Nelson's national stature was secured on the East Coast as early as 1967, when she became the first among the Harry Who to exhibit at the Whitney Museum of Art and would become one of the first women to receive a solo exhibition there in 1973. And on the West Coast, she participated in numerous exhibitions in California, and a rigorous international exhibition schedule saw her work appear in numerous venues across Canada, South America, and the United Kingdom. Since 1966, Nelson's work has been the subject of over 50 solo exhibitions, and her work is featured in the collections of major museums around the world. The Art Institute of Chicago, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art, the Morgan Library, New York, the MCA Chicago, the Museum of Modern Art, New York, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and Yale University Art Gallery, just to name a few. Ever in demand, Nelson's national schedule of visiting artist engagements and artistic output flourished alongside her regular teaching duties at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where she still teaches today. From distinguished alumna to honorary doctorate awardee, Nelson's contributions reverberate far beyond SAIC. Hardly exhaustive, this formidable list of accomplishments belies Nelson's position as a woman artist working from the vantage point of Chicago, who remarkably achieved her fame as a watercolorist. Concealing graphite underdrawings under layers of colorful transparent washes, the crisply defined edges of Nelson's forms are strikingly contrasted by her skillful wet on wet brushwork. Taken together, her unparalleled technical expertise has earned Nelson a reputation as one of America's premier watercolorists. This Lifetime Achievement Award recognizes Gladys's continuous career, which as recently as pre-pandemic, culminated in simultaneous openings in New York's Chelsea Gallery District, featuring works spanning Harry Who era reverse plexiglass paintings to recent large-scale watercolor wash and collages on paper. And in recognition of her continued success, she appeared not once, but twice in the New York Times in the beginning of 2020. And as COVID-19 has malingered on, Nelson has worked undeterred. During this time, she began a series of COVID cuties, small gouaches on paper that show women navigating the pandemic, one that was riddled with anxiety and uncertainty. While difficult, the beginning of the quarantine period had been, a, been one of the artist's most prolific. Nelson had completed an average of one work every 36 hours. There was nothing else I wanted to do, she said of her daily practice. And her signature playful inventiveness was on full view in a solo exhibition held at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art that very summer. Visitors were greeted by her tidal wall mural featuring a gumby-limbed big gal beckoning them to enter. 
Nelson continues to create, and through her work, she celebrates the wisdom and confidence that comes with age. I am reflecting on aging and how you have interest, and you are interesting, no matter what age level you are at, she says. Our whole society is so youth-oriented that I'm sure that once a person hits 20, it's like, well, it's all downhill from now on. But the characters are very, if you don't like the way I look, then don't look. And I rather enjoy that. Congratulations, Gladys, on this momentous milestone achievement. Thank you for your kindness, your grace, and for sharing your talent and your incredible world with us. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you over the years and an absolute honor to know you. Thank you. Thank you, Mel, for giving us insight as to where Gladys finds her inspiration and how she uses it to create work that explores the human condition and reflects our shared humanity. We honor you, Gladys Nilsson, for your multi-layered work that explores aspects of human sexuality and its inherent contradictions. Congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. You're welcome. I am very pleased that uh, I am being recognized. I am thrilled to get this honor. Mm -hmm. It means a lot to me. I love my chosen field, but it's also nice to have somebody else love it too. Thank you. Well, we are thrilled to have you as one of our honorees and congratulations. Thank you. I am in New York City celebrating Lorraine O'Grady. I met with Lorraine in her studio in the Meatpacking District in Manhattan to honor her with her Lifetime Achievement Award. She's currently preparing for the debut screening of Greetings and Theses, which documents her 2021 performance at the Brooklyn Museum as part of her retrospective, Lorraine O'Grady, Both And. Our next presenter is Stephanie Sparling Williams, PhD. She's the Andrew W. Mellon Curator of American Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Stephanie authored Lorraine's essay for the Lifetime Achievement Award catalog, and she will speak about the amazing legacy Lorraine has built over the past 40 years. My name is Stephanie Sparling Williams, and I am the Andrew Mellon Curator of American Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And I have the absolute privilege of introducing an artist who truly needs no introduction because she is one of the most significant and certainly one of the most interesting creatives and intellectuals of our time. And of course, I'm speaking of the ever brilliant, ever transformative, ever groundbreaking, ever incisive, ever attentive feminist conceptual force that is artist Lorraine O'Grady. I say it quite often because I believe it so deeply to be true. We are living in the reign of Lorraine. Today in her late 80s, O'Grady is more productive than ever, with her work now exhibited widely and engaged in both art media and scholarship. These past two years alone, she has held the contemporary art world transfixed. It has been a moment when critics, curators, and artists alike have been captivated stunned even by O'Grady's important 40 year legacy as it is being presented to us afresh in so many exciting ways and for audiences eager to experience and embrace her brand of avant-garde creative sensibility. Significantly, the Brooklyn Museum celebrated this work in a recent major retrospective curated by Catherine Morris and independent writer Aruna D'Souza. The exhibition, Lorraine O'Grady Both And, recently brought together the artist's impressive oeuvre under one roof and into multidisciplinary and trans-historical conversations across the museum's permanent collection galleries. For those less familiar with O'Grady herself, the artist's varied and illustrious career trajectory, along with her bicultural upbringing as part of New England's Black middle class, became rich material influences within her work, which challenges the status quo and seeks to upend the kind of binary thinking endemic in Western thought. 
while her performances as Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir, 1980 to 1983, a rogue debutante who shouted poems calling for Black artists to take more risks, and a subsequent iteration of that persona in Art Is in 1983, these are O'Grady's most visible and celebrated pieces. But I have argued in my own writing on the artist that magnum opus, River's First Draft, made in 1982, is actually Lorraine O'Grady's most important work. Created for the series Art Across the Park in New York Central Park, O'Grady described this groundbreaking performance work as a collage in space. I beg you to check it out on her website. It is truly a gem that many people often miss. This work further catalyzed and complicated the artist's conceptual deployment of the diptych form, a significant innovation in O'Grady's practice, which became increasingly important moving into the 1990s. In addition to O'Grady's tremendously significant body of performances, collages, and photo-based installations, her writing has also received considerable attention, particularly her much anthologized essay, Olympia's Maid, Reclaiming Black Female Subjectivity, which appeared first in After Image, 1992. In 2020 and amidst the global health pandemic, Duke University Press published a generous sampling of O'Grady's writing, edited and introduced by D'Souza in Writing in Space, 1973 to 2019. Throughout her career, O'Grady has received numerous awards including a fellowship from the Bunting Institute at Radcliffe College, Harvard University in 1995, Anonymous Was a Woman Award in 2008, the United States Artist Rockefeller Fellowship in Visual Art in 2011, the College Art Association's Distinguished Feminist Award in 2014, the Creative Capital Award in Visual Arts in 2015, and a Lifetime Achievement Award as part of Howard University's annual James A. Porter Colloquium on African American Art in 2015. She is being recognized in this moment by the press and certainly here in this context for WCA's Lifetime Achievement Honor. Finally, and perhaps most enduring, O'Grady's practice and intellectual generosity has inspired a generation of artists, including Adam Pendleton, Anoni, Ayana Evans, Malik Gaines, Nick Moss, Simone Lee, Zawe Ashton, and many, 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 many others. O'Grady's work has also catalyzed new scholarship, such as my own work in Speaking Out of Turn, Lorraine O'Grady and the Art of Language, out in 2021 by University of California Press. That also of Adrian Edwards' work in 2016, Ellen Taney in 2015, Yuri McMillan also in 2015, and Judith Wilson writing so brilliantly about O'Grady's work since 1991. It is apt that O'Grady should receive this special recognition on this day, in this week, in this year, and in this special moment, peak reign of Lorraine. In the early 1980s, O'Grady spoke out of turn, calling upon Black creatives to take more risks. 40 years later, the art world is still grappling with her call. To Lorraine, I am so blessed to know you, to be living and breathing this air with you. It is so, so, so sweet, and you deserve all of the flowers. All of my love and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for your inspiring presentation on the reign of Lorraine and sharing with us her vast body of work, including not only her performances, collages, and photo-based installations, but her important writings as well. Thank you. Lorraine O'Grady, we honor you, Lorraine O'Grady, for your work that explores cultural construction of identity as shaped by the experience of diaspora and hybridity. Thank Congratulations. You. Oh, thank you so much. We are so excited to have you as one of our Lifetime Achievement Awardees. My goodness, it's so beautiful too. And it has balance. I'll be able to stand it up and, there you and, go. Show, and show it mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. It's very heavy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. You know, I am so uh, thrilled to be to receive this honor, um, especially in the 50th anniversary. But the when you look at the women who've received it, you know, you just can't help but feel proud to be mm -hmm. part of that company. And I want, just want to say that uh, I'm not sure that I really... Uh, was with the uh, program of the Women's Caucus for Art when it first started, mm -hmm. but I certainly became with it as 
life went, as life went, and time went on, right? Uh -huh. And um, I feel that throughout my career, my strongest support has been from feminists, mm -hmm. you know, always. And this is just uh, this is just an addition to that understanding. Mm -hmm. And I I can't tell you how grateful I am or appreciative, I should say, not grateful, but very appreciative of this award. Well, thank you. And we couldn't be more thrilled to have you as one of our awardees. It's very exciting. You have a, a amazing career and you're an inspiration to us all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm honoring Linda Vallejo at her home studio in Topanga, California. She's looking forward to her solo exhibition at D2 Gallery in Westwood, California, featuring her newest objects of opulence, which are full-size Victorian rooms painted with milk chocolate brown polka dots and surrounded by objects from the Victorian Gilded Age. I'd like to introduce curator, author, visual artist, and educator Amalia Mesa Baines. Amalia first met Linda through a Chicana artist community back at the very start of Linda's career. Amalia will be speaking about Linda's vast body of multidisciplinary work. I am pleased today to be part of the recognition of Linda Vallejo for the Women's Caucus for Art Lifetime Achievement Award of 2022. I met Linda in the 1970s as part of a community of Chicana artists in California. And later she was part of my dissertational research on the influence of culture on the development identity among Chicana artists. Her work was very much focused on indigenous traditions and ceremony, critical to the emerging identity of Chicana women at that time. As the years have passed, I have been heartened to see her work flourish and encompass issues of gender, race, and representation. Her skillful use of various mediums has also expanded. I would like today to highlight some of her most current work and visual production. Linda Vallejo creates work that visualizes what it means to be a person of color in the US and particularly for women of color. Her work reflects the experiences and knowledge gathered over four decades of engagement with the Latino, Chicano, and American indigenous communities. In the 1970s and 80s in Los Angeles, she worked in the Chicano community with self-help graphics, the feminist community at the Women's Building, and African-American community at William Grant Still Community Arts and Brockman Gallery. She also owned Galeria Las Americas, presenting contemporary Latino and Chicano arts for many years. In 2018, she participated in seven of the Getty Pacific Standard Time initiatives, co-curating Day of the Dead, A Legacy, Past, Present, and Future, as self-help graphics and presented the opening ceremony for the Doing It in Public Feminism and Art at the Women's Building. She was a visiting instructor for Otis College Public Practice MFA program. She's been a mentor for Mujeres de Maiz, a feminist collective, and volunteered for Native and Chicana Indigenous circles with a 15-year commitment to incarcerated women. The Los Angeles-based artist has spent the better part of the last decade infusing biting humor into her multidisciplinary work. The result is Brown Belongings, an expansive body of work in containing multiple series that explore what Vallejo calls her brown intellectual property. 
the experiences, knowledge, and emotion she's gathered from over four decades of immersive Chicano and Chicana and Indigenous American studies. During her more than 40-year career, Leo has worked across a variety of medium, including screen printing, painting, drawing, and sculpture, and has been featured in numerous exhibitions and publications. Her work is held in the permanent collections of the East Los Angeles College Vincent Price Museum, the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, the Carnegie Art Museum in Oxnard, California, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and also the University of California, Santa Barbara, California Multicultural and Ethnic Archives. This year, La Plaza in Los Angeles will exhibit new works by Vallejo alongside selections from several recent series and sub-series of artworks that examine brownness and Latinx identity, including Make Them All Mexican, The Brown Oscars, The Brown Dot Project, Datos Sagrados, and Cultural Enigma. I'd like now to show some of those images. The first image is called Brown Belongings. It's an overall shot, and these are works from 2010 to 2020. Linda Vallejo Brown Belongings consists of more than 125 of Vallejo's paintings, drawings, and sculptures, and will examine how race and color, as expressed through images and data, affect our perception and experience of culture. The second image is also from Brown Belongings. At the same time, these works ask us how embracing brownness can allow us to creatively question, deflect, and resist stereotypes and assumptions about Latinx people. Work from different series will combine in thematic groups throughout La Plaza's galleries, allowing the visitors to see ideas that resonate across Vallejo's body of work. This next image, La Victoria, from Make Em All Mexican, takes classic representations of beauty and transforms them as brown figures, including the winged victory of Samothrace from the Hellenic period embraced as often thought of as the perfect figure. The detail of uh, La Victoria also transforms with other symbols of beauty, such as Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe and the Mona Lisa as brown figures. The Three Graces, once again, Vallejo proposes the neoclassical Canova statues of the Three Graces to be seen as brown. The Three Graces or Charities are the daughters of Zeus who entertain his guests with their beauty and charm. Her works ask us to question the history of beauty, race, power, and even desirability. Superman, perhaps one of the most potent figures of strength, heroes and power, the newly brown Superman gives these qualities to a man of color, a Mexican. Fred and Barney from Make Em All Mexican even takes up the figures of humor and joy and popular culture. The COVID chair. Among the brown belongings, Vallejo designates brown as the COVID chair, acknowledging the high number of COVID cases and deaths disproportionate to the Latinx population. Some data put the number as high as one quarter to one third of all COVID deaths. Little Boy Blue. In this series, the classical figure of Little Boy Blue by Gainsborough a painting once considered one of the most expensive in the world and which was purchased by American railroad magnate Henry Huntington from the UK museums. Vallejo has transformed Little Boy Blue into a Mexican brown figure for the tradition of Days of the Dead, which often honor the death of children on November 1st. Little Boy Blue is also about race, representation, and the melding of cultural tradition. The Coca-Cola can, in the objects of the brown belongings, 
Vallejo transforms a ubiquitous Mexican Coca-Cola bottle with indigenous textile patterns. Coca-Cola, a detail and a reminder of the power of the object of popular culture in Mexico. Datos Sagrados, or sacred data. 75.5% of immigrants are lawful. In this series, Vallejo turns their investigative eye to the data on Mexicans that is so often used against us to portray negative perceptions, particular in this period of divisiveness in America. Datos Sagrados, 43.3% of farmers are Latino. These sacred data illuminate the role of Mexicans and other Latinos in the world of agriculture, especially in California, and are particularly telling in the coming age of climate change, where agricultural worlds will change. Datos Sagrados, 91.2% of Los Angeles East Side are Latino. With the data, Vallejo creates a visual and cultural picture of Latinos in Los Angeles. And one of the most intriguing, the Brown Oscars. The LA Times talks about the Brown Oscars and this work calls attention to the glaring absence of Latinos, both in front of the screen and behind the camera and the pervasive single standard for beauty, which is white. Linda, has integrated the race, gender, and representation throughout her career from early work to the incredible tour de force of brown belongings. Linda Vallejo has kept her commitments to cultural equity as well as gender equity. And as many intersectional feminists, her support for women is woven through the issues of race and representation. Her work with the Southern California Caucus for the Arts at the Santa Ana College Gallery in Stories of Land in 2021, as well as her inclusion in her land, the exhibition from the collection, the Museum of Latin American Art, are but a few of her recent exhibitions. I am proud today to recognize the Lifetime Achievement Award for my comadre Linda Vallejo. Amalia. Thank you so much for sharing Linda's work, exploring important issues regarding the politics and representation in the United States for the Chicano, Latino, and American indigenous communities. We honor you, Linda Vallejo, for your work that addresses Mexican American identity within the context of American art and pop culture. Congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award from Thank the USA. You. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Of course, I want to thank WCA for this great honor and this privilege. And I want to thank my very special friends, Karen Mary Davalos, Susana Smith Bautista, and Amalia Mesa Baines for all their support over all the years in this incredible art world that we live in. Thank you again. Hey everyone, we're back. That was truly amazing. You know, mm -hmm. um, we've been watching this over and over again, but in this way of technically dot here, um, lighting here, but to sit and watch it with you all and to like take in it as a whole, it's just been a real pleasure. So I'm going to... Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to share a few things and then I'm going to hand it to Laura to like tell us a little bit more about her experience. But there were some things that just popped out tonight for me, like um, when Linda said, wherever I am, I feel at home as long as I can make art. And like I'm putting that on the shirt tomorrow. I'm not. Um, and, you know, be to know that. Me, being a, you know, I'm from Detroit, but I've been following Women Made for years. So you're in, you know this because you're winning this award. That, but your inspiration, it, it goes beyond just that city of Chicago. 
um, some other just amazing, it was so much, so much, but um, um, Gladys's COVID cuties, I, I love that. And being an illustrator and drawer myself, her work really speaks to me. Mm -hmm. Lorraine O'Grady to be doing amazing work into your her 80s mm -hmm. and continuing to do that. That was an inspiration to me. And I saw a comment that said, oh, I feel lazy, you know, because of all this work they're turning out. Don't feel bad, I, I feel the same way, but we got time. That's what this is telling us, we got time to do it. Um, I've been like cyber stalking Linda Vejeo for like the last couple of years and to see her, her work from um, Make Them All Mexican, I just, I just love that. So it was so much to see. I'm glad I'm getting this chance to kind of see it with everyone. And just want to ask Laura, like you got a chance to go into the studios and see everything. Could you just share what that experience was like? Well, for me, it was an experience of a lifetime being able to go into all of these amazing artist studios and spaces and see their work and have long conversations with them while the film crew was setting up all of their lights and cameras. Um, I had a lot of favorite moments. Um, kind of go through each one a little bit. Uh, Linda Benglitz's studio on the desert was just amazing. Um, the light was incredible. To see her work in person was a true treat. Um, I just had so much fun talking to her. And um, also, I have to say, I loved her little dog, Cleo, who just goes with her everywhere. Um, so that was uh, my first kickoff it was at Linda Banglis' studio. Um, Gladys, Gladys and I just had the longest, nicest conversation and chat while they were, uh, the guys were setting up. We talked a lot about process process which I always find very intriguing I love to learn about all of the artists processes and how they work um, so that was fascinating for me uh, Lorraine just really blew me away with her video work and her technology and I have to say watching her do her sword exercises was a lot of fun we all had a great time with her um, Beata, we had a lot of fun at Women Make Gallery. We really had a long day there because we um, did some of the intro and the intro work and the, the follow up. Um, we uh, had a lot of laughs with Beata and the crew, who was amazing, by the way. A big shout out to Steve and Kyle um, for all the hard work they did. Um, we had a great lunch with her and her daughter, and uh, you know she really is quite the powerhouse. I was came away very impressed. Um, and Len, Linda Vallejo, my last visit was to Linda Vallejo's studio. And again, we had just really wonderful conversations about what it means to be an artist. Um, being able to see her work uh, in person was a revelation to me. It really does all look like chocolate. Really, really gorgeous work. Um, I admire her so much. Um, so I just had just a real blast traveling to everyone's studios. Um, you know, I've witnessed the Lifetime Achievement Award ceremonies uh, so many over the course of my 25 plus years as a WCA member going to uh, conferences, um, almost all the conferences during that time. Um, it's always been a highlight of my uh, time spent at the WCA conferences. I always come away so inspired by the artists and really this time was no different. Um, you know, recognizing these women's contributions to the arts, not only spotlights their work, but really um, raises, truly raises us all up as women in the arts. And really that's why I've been a member of this organization for so long. Um, I really do believe in the mission for the Women's Caucus for Arts. So, um, yeah. So that's it for now. I don't want to take up too much time because we still have some some more to go. Yeah, I mean, one thing you brought up was about why you keep doing this work, why you love being a part, a member, more than a member of WCA. I want to ask Sandra that same question. What do you love and about WCA? Why did you become a member? So thank you for that question. And I want to first acknowledge a young lady 
who recently passed away um, on February 6th, Cherie Redlinger, who was a, a, more, a longtime member of WCA. She showed up at my very, very first uh, solo exhibition back in 2012 and mentioned this organization. You should come and check us out and come to a meeting. So about 10 and a half years ago, I became a member. And it wasn't until I attended my first conference, which was in 2016 here in the DC area, that I really became to know what WCA was all about. The exhibitions, the panels, CAA, meeting all kinds of people. I think Laura, I may have met, met you there the first time. Yeah. And um, it's really allowed me to sort of blossom and grow and become more confident in my practice. And then last, but absolutely not least, just the friendship and the fellowship that happens, um, not only in your local chapter, but now that we've got this phenomenal technology right now, we get to meet one another across the globe. And so if nothing else that I take away from, you know, Lifetime Achievement Award, one, as Donna had said, we've got plenty of time to continue working. And one of the things that really sort of stands out even with this particular uh, group of women who've been awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award is we can afford to be bold and brass and do whatever it is that we wanna do as artists. And WCA is that sort of environment that really nurtures and really supports that mission. Um, and I can't wait to see what else is gonna happen as we continue this journey. I'll turn it back over um, to, to Donna. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I I'm the I've been in part of this group a little less time than both of you ladies. Um, and what brought me here is more practical reasons. Uh, I learned about WCA through a friend, became a member, and one of the things I felt that was important is that this national platform that was built on feminism needed to expand even more when it comes to um, women of color or artists of color. That's That was a major thing for me. And um, seeing some of the work that brought me into it and seeing the desire from membership wanting that too, that really inspired me to come aboard and, and ta-da, I'm here. So um, this has been a great night so far. But in order for us to do this type of work and presentation, we always need support, whether it's through volunteering or if it's through membership or it's through donations. And I'm going to let Sandra tell you how you can support in those ways. All right. And my best PBS uh, infomercial here. <laughs> Right. So you can see your QR code over to your left. Um, there's ways for you to support in that manner. Um, we have T-shirts. We have the poster contest. Um, the Lifetime Achievement Award catalog is available on our website. And in order for us to continue doing these types of programs moving forward, we have to have that financial support. So we we really, really implore you to take a minute to um do a donation, visit the website, see what type of materials and um, merchandise that we have out there. Again, we want to be able to continue offering these types of programs. I really do sound like PBS right now. <laughs> um, but um, good. again, make sure you take a look at the merchandise, make sure you participate in some of the contests that we have. You know, sometimes this is an, an additional way to, to earn some funds for yourself as an individual artist. And with that, um, I'm going to let us continue our presentation. The President's Award for Art and Activism recognizes mid-career women in the arts whose life and work exemplify WCA's mission statement, creating community through art education and social activism. We are pleased to award Detroit artist Sabrina Nelson President's Award for Art and Activism. Her work references the experiences of Black women in our current landscape, and her activism supports and builds the creative culture in her native city of Detroit. 
Her roots run deep in the city of Detroit, and she is a force in building and supporting the creative culture in the city she loves so dearly. She calls herself an artivist, a person who uses their creative voice to talk about the time they live in. Beginning as a painter, she received her degree from Detroit's College for Creative Studies. She has moved into all matters of mixed media and the scope of her work includes painting, drawing, sculpture, objects, murals, and installations. Much of her work is figurative and references the experiences of black women and mothers in the current landscape. I was especially moved by her Why You Want to Fly Blackbird series which she has worked on over the course of several years. The work is about black women losing their children, young and old, to violent death. Her seductive artwork invites you in then delivers a visceral morning experience. Paintings and drawings of blackbirds combined with powerful installations of empty bird cages representing empty wombs tucked inside of the floating dresses bring forth a deep sadness for those precious lives taken and all of the potential that is lost with them. Her powerful work demands recognition that a life is a life, a human is a human. Sabrina is committed to mentoring and supporting young artists and designers in the business of making it as an artist. For over 25 years, she has worked in arts administration at the College for Creative Studies and the Detroit Institute of Arts, where she motivates and prepares students to pursue art degrees in Detroit. Sabrina has lectured on the preservation of Black feminism in art at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit. She is a guest curator at both the Carr Center and the Music Hall Performing Arts Center. She's judged numerous art competitions, curated art talks and exhibits, and conducted artist interviews for the City of Detroit's culture video channel, My Detroit Cable. She's a 2021 Kresge Artist Fellow her work has been exhibited at the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, the African American Art and Culture Complex in San Francisco, Art Basel, and the American University in Paris. Her work is in the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History's permanent collection and private collections throughout the United States. We honor you, Sabrina Nelson, for your work building and supporting Detroit's creative culture. Congratulations on your President's Award for Art and Activism, Sabrina. We are so pleased and honored to have you as our President's Awardee for 2022. Thank you so much. I wanna say thank you to the Women's Caucus for Art, Laura, Donna, I really appreciate this and um, I'm overwhelmed with it, I should say. You know, I'm, I consider myself a womanist. And so when the Women's Caucus for Arts uh, let me know that I won for what I call artivism, it certainly um, touched my heart and my womb and my brain and my being and my womaning. So I really, really, really appreciate being seen by other beings who are like me, who come with their wombs and you know, uh, as Jessica Kerr Moore says, we carry in us constellations that are waiting to be named, whether it's the birth of art, the birth of our children, the birth of nurturing others. You know, not all of us are birth mothers, but some of us are earth mothers. We are chosen, you know, and um, in the words of Nina Simone, it's our duty to reflect the times that we live in. So for your emerging artists and for art and activism, we are reflecting what we see. We are the, um, the folks who bear witness to the times that we live in. And so losing my father to the, the coronavirus in uh, April of 2020, you know, I look to the birds, the corvid birds of the crow and the raven who like the poetic terms for a group of crows is called a murder of crows. And the poetic term for a group of ravens is called an unkindness of ravens or a conspiracy of ravens. So as we live in this time and die in this time, 
Um, I'm thinking about all the empty nests, like the one behind me, where they will not return. Um, and all the wombs that carry these babies, and some of them have to bury them. That's what my Blackbird series is about. Like, you know, I didn't want to have to think about my father's death at that time. And sometimes, you know, seeing is believing, but you, like, I'm overwhelmed with what I see, like Philando Castile's death. Why is this happening? Or the little girl who's attacked by the police and his knee is on her back. Or the idea that this young woman is in her apartment and they come in shooting and she's no longer here. So just thinking about the idea that we have control when we really don't. <laughs> you know, and we have to figure out not what we can do um, always to, to stop it, but how do we react to it? And so for me, using my artwork is the best thing I can do because that's the only muscles I feel like I have. It's my voice. And so if I can say, don't kill us, if I can say it didn't start with Emmett Till, if I can say Sandra Bland shouldn't have died by getting a stopping ticket for whatever she dealt with, if I can say stop killing indigenous children and brown women, who don't look like they're valued in their community, stop taking them. And that's what I feel like my Blackbirds represent. And so if you can see that, thank you. Sometimes I'm preaching to the choir, right? So I wanna thank the Women's Caucus for Arts for having this platform, for having this group, for having this collective, because the art world is full of men who don't look like us. And typically they're white young men or white older men that um, sit up here in the hierarchy of art, right? And um, with the Gorilla Girls and those who came before us, who, um, you know, uh, put us on pedestals to say we have a voice too. And what we have to say is not always soft and uh, what is the word, dainty if you will. I appreciate um, what we have here as a collective. I appreciate um, being recognized um, for activism, which I call artivism, because I don't know how you separate the two. But I was also born during the rebellion of 67. And so I was born with that fight in me. And um, I don't think I'm going to stop until I absolutely have to. I don't see that happening until the breath is gone. So I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep transitioning. I'm gonna keep moving with the times and reflecting the times. And I'm gonna keep being as loud as I can in a very sensual way of saying the things I need to say. And so I thank you. Well, I want to speak about your work because I met you, like truly met you when you were starting your Blackbird um series i love the the blackbirds i love the nest and what they state i mean even these you talk about i don't know if it was on purpose or whatever to describe these beautiful black birds and i you can't help but look at it from a racial space but you in your work shows the beauty of the physical bird but also the beauty in death the beauty in all these different things. It's just, they're magical to look at. So if you haven't seen Sabrina's Blackbird series, you must. But all of that, I really want people to go and see Sabrina's work because those things, life and death go hand in hand and you beautifully bring it together in your work. Thank so you. Sabrina is six degrees from each Detroiter, you know, when it comes to the art world here. And um, to be able to bring her spirit, her energy into this national space, she's already there, national, international, but to be able to get other eyes on her brilliance, I'm, I'm glad that I was a part of that. So, so yeah, about time. We are just thrilled to have you as our awardee for 2022 and in our 50th year. So thank you thank for you. all that you do and all that you are doing and all that you will continue to do.
In celebration of the 50th year of the Women's Caucus for Art, a new President's Award has been created to honor up and coming artists who embody the future in the arts for women with the new WCA Emerging Artist Award. Chicago artist Ashley January is our very first Emerging Artist awardee. Her work is focused on bringing awareness to the crisis of the Black maternal mortality. As WCA looks towards its future, we seek to celebrate artists like these two inspiring women who truly embody WCA's mission and are working to create change and make a positive impact in our world. Chicago artist Ashley January's recent work addresses the growing crisis of Black women's maternal mortality and morbidity rates in the United States. Her series of paintings combined with sound narratives of Black mothers who have been diagnosed with preeclampsia and their children who were born prematurely serve as a call to action for more awareness and research to eradicate unnecessary maternal and infant death. The work stems from her experience with her first pregnancy ending abruptly with a traumatic delivery. She was diagnosed with preeclampsia at 32 weeks and two days later prematurely delivered her two pound 13 ounce baby boy. Both survived, but the outcome could have been very different. Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related complications than white women. Through her figurative paintings and portraits, Ashley uplifts Black mothers and children. She has been drawing figures since she was a child and has a fascination with depicting emotive faces and gestures in her work. She feels that portraiture is a powerful tool to document the current time and represent people who matter. As she says, Black people in particular need to be seen by everyone and especially by themselves in institutions around the world. Born in Rantoul, Illinois in 1987, Ashley earned her MFA at the Laguna College of Art and Design in 2017 and her bachelor's degree from Bradley University. Ashley exhibits her work throughout the United States. She received the first place award at Women May Gallery's 2018 Midwest Open Juried Exhibition for her piece, Identity Fragmentation, a Self-Portrait, 2017. Her work, Family Portrait, received the Beverly Bank Best of Show Award at the Beverly Art Center's 2017 Annual Competition, and she was a round three juried winner for the 2016 Art Slant Prize. She's volunteered her time for Girls Steam Ahead, which serves seventh to 12th grade females students, bringing them together with women working in steam fields. She worked as a representative for the Laguna College of Art and Design, for Graduate National Portfolio Day, and she sponsored a team in her son's honor for the March of Dimes Annual March for Babies. She volunteers through her sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Inc., in their Target One initiative, Hashtag CAP, College Admission Process, which assists students applying to colleges. Through Hashtag CAP, Ashley helps young women considering a profession in the arts. So if you'd like to hold it up for us Thank so we can see it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Okay. <laughs> honor you, Ashley January, for your Thank contemporary you. portraiture uplifting and honoring Black mothers and their children. Congratulations on being the very first WCA Emerging Artist Awardee. Um, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude to have been selected to receive the 2022 Women's Caucus for Art Emerging Artist Award. Thank you all so much for being here to share this occasion. I am so honored and I want to express deep gratitude to have my work recognized in this way by the Women's Caucus for Art. Many years went into this project and it means so much to me that the work that I am so passionate about also resonates with others. I just want to briefly reflect on how I got to this point. When I was a child, I always had an interest in portraiture, from drawing imagined faces on the side of the court during my sister's tennis lessons, to taking photos with my Polaroid camera. 
Um, that passion stayed with me in high school when I took my first photography and drawing classes. During my senior year in high school, I was offered scholarships and had been recruited to study art as a major. But ultimately, I turned down those opportunities because I lacked the confidence to pursue art full time and I wasn't sure how it could be financially sustainable. But later in college, I chose to major in communications. I specialized in advertising. Um, I felt that I needed to earn a degree that was going to support my independence post-graduation. But I also chose to minor in studio art because I couldn't fully detach myself from the arts. I knew art making was something I would return to and continue to practice in some shape or form throughout my life. It was my gift, I believe. It wasn't until later on after working in marketing and event planning that I realized I needed to hone my craft professionally. I later enrolled at a local atelier to help build my foundational drawing and painting skills and my confidence. It took me a long time to even call myself an artist. I felt that there is so much to the history of the title artist. And there's so much heaviness that weighs in that title. But after building my portfolio for two and a half years, I applied to one graduate school program at the Laguna College of Art and Design. And I received my MFA in painting in 2017. And soon um, afterwards, I started my motherhood journey, which ultimately led to this latest body of work. So this accomplishment is not something that I did alone, and there are many others who deserve to share in this award. I would like to thank Kyle, my husband, for all the emotional support and your continued stability. I wouldn't be able to find the time to dedicate to my practice if not for your support and hard work and consistently taking care of us. Sarah, for being my studio assistant for the past three years while juggling your college career. Family members and friends who consistently showed up to me, showed up to support me at shows whenever I asked them to. And thank you to everyone who provided emotional support, education, and insight along the way. My parents, June and Gregory, and my other parents, Denise and Gary. Thank you for your love and support throughout my artistic career. I especially want to thank all of the mothers and children who chose to participate in this initiative to help bring awareness to the Black maternal health crisis. To the children who participated in this project, Quinn, Nina, Dylan, and Samuel, you all continue to persevere and bring light into the world with your gifts, despite all the odds that come along with premature birth. Thank you to the mothers, Pia, Crystal, and Amber. You allowed me to document your moments of joy and peace in your personal dwelling spaces with your children and your family. It takes courage to show vulnerability and speak your truth so that others are better informed. Without your willingness to use your voice in this way and recount the trauma that you suffered, during your pregnancy and postpartum, I would not have been able to shed light on this issue in this particularly delicate way. Last but not least, thank you to the Women's Caucus for Art for offering recognition to emerging artists like myself. I hope that this recognition of my work can serve as an inspiration to others working in the arts. Because of this award, I was offered my first solo show at the Beverly Arts Center, currently going on now, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the opportunity to utilize that space and showcase my work. In working towards bridging the gap, it is critical for art institutions to provide opportunities for women artists of color to participate and showcase their artwork. By focusing on important issues through my work, I aim to make some type of positive impact and change. If my work can make any type of positive change, so can yours. My efforts bringing awareness to the Black maternal health crisis has only just started. I look forward to working with healthcare professionals and finding solutions to the disparities that disproportionately affect Black, Brown, 
and Indigenous women and children. I think art can carve out a dialogue that questions our own humanity and how we can make it better for future generations. I'm humbled and appreciative. Thank you so much. Your work is just so amazing and so timely um, with everything that's going on um, with Roe v. Wade to speak about this specific um, challenge that Black women, Black mothers are having, and then to do it in such a beautiful way. I, I have a list of favorites, so um, I, I'm glad that I could be part of this. I'm thankful that Laura brought me in, and I think a lot of artists and definitely female artists could understand that space of one, can I even take on this um, title of artist because that means something that right. you maybe didn't feel like you were. And, exactly. but if they can't take that away from you now. You're like completely <laughs> deep down artiste. You can even make that your middle name if you want. <laughs> artiste. <laughs> Ashley oh. Artiste January. <laughs>
the um, commission that comes from you buying those posters as well as the t-shirt. These are ways that you can um, have fabulous art and fabulous wear on your body, but also supporting WCA and women artists. And I have Sandra's gonna give us a little bit more about that. Go ahead, take it PBS. All right. <laughs> anyway, thanks everybody. So again, uh, don't forget the QR code is to the left of your screen. We are, um, you've got the text message going across the bottom there. And again, the Lifetime Achievement Catalog, I think I've collected one from each uh, conference I've been to. What a wonderful way to support our organization and to support our uh, sister artists. Um, you know, again, when the t-shirt contest comes out, you wanna make sure that you submit your design you want to, again, you're, you're, you're adding some financial benefit to the artist that creates those t-shirts, but you're also giving back. Make sure that you take a peek at our website. Again, the QR code is to your left. You can text message your donation that's scrolling down at the bottom and do not hesitate to visit the website to see all the merchandise that's available. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Laura. All right. Well, we were gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, if anyone had any questions or remarks, um, but to be honest, I don't see them on my personal screen here. So I don't know how we should- I think we're okay. I think everybody yeah. enjoyed themselves. That's what we're gonna go with. Everyone enjoyed All themselves. Right. It was a beautiful- I've been time. loving seeing the congratulations during when I've been um, on, on camera giving the awards and um, you know, it really is, again, was a really rewarding experience for me. Um, but I hope for you all too, watching the awards in, pers uh, in person and in the comfort of your own home. So we've really come to the end of our program, um, to the end of celebrating these great women just on camera, but we will continue to celebrate them all year long. Um, I wanna thank you so much for being a part of our program. Um, and I really wanna thank again, uh, Janice Nesser Chu and the Lifetime Achievement Award Committee for all of the work that goes into not only selecting our awardees each and every year, but also for creating this award presentation. Um, you know, thank you um, for all that you do. Um, and everyone have a really good night and continue the celebration. I hope um, you're raising your glasses in person and having a good time. Um, and have a wonderful evening. Take care of you.